Good day. Thanks for continuing to take part in ETA. Hope it's been an encouragement to you as we've journeyed along. We're going to dive into John chapter 17 here. And uh, you'll notice that oftentimes we are studying two chapters at once. Today we're just going to study one chapter because I wanted to keep it in its context of Jesus meeting in this intimate way with his disciples um, in chapter 13, 14, and 15, 16, and now 17. We have his, his uh, upper room discourse, it's often called, or his, this time before um, his crucifixion that he shares with his disciples. And so I want to keep it in that context. Um, and so you've only had to study one chapter this week, and we're only going to teach one chapter this week. But that doesn't mean that it's quicker and easier. There's a lot in here. One thing to note, um, parents, if you're here on Sunday morning, if you're doing this, you know, midweek or whatever, that's that's fine. This doesn't apply to you. You can just plug your ears for a second. But if you have kids uh, downstairs with Christine this morning, um, you ought to pick them up on time. Um, they do need to be signed out from their ETA discipleship time downstairs with Christine, preferably be by 9.45 so that Christine can uh, get those ones out and then get ready for the, the larger group coming in for Sunday school during the service. And so just don't forget to do that. Um, I know that uh, it's a little jam-packed sometimes in the group time, but I uh, would ask that at least one of you run down there and sign them out. Uh, that would be great. All right, let's get into John chapter 17. There's a couple things here. Um, to take note. As you read through it, you probably noticed that glory or glorification is, is quite a theme in John chapter 17. It's used eight times just in the prayer of Jesus in, seven, in chapter 17. Um, there's also a lot of reference to the word or the word given or received. This idea of giving and receiving is referenced at least 17 times. And seven times Jesus says that the believers are the Father's gift to the Son. Which is fascinating because we often, and I think rightly so, um, but there's a balance here that needs to be struck. We often rightly so think, think that Jesus is God's gift to us, which is true. We think John 3, 16, right? He's, he, is our, he is God's gift to us. But there's also a very real sense that we are the Father's gift to the Son. And that Jesus alludes to that seven times throughout this prayer. Jesus is also, um, you can break it down a couple different ways. In one sense, he's praying for himself in the first few verses. And in, this, in the second chunk of verses, starting in, in verse 6, he begins to pray for his disciples, for the 12 that surround him, for, for those that he's walked with, his current, his current following. Um, and then after, he begins to pray for you and for me, which is really a fascinating thought as well, that Jesus is praying for you and for me, which is why I asked the question this last week, how, has, how have the prayers that Jesus has prayed for you been answered in your life and in the lives of others? And so there's lots of different ways that we could pick this apart and we could work through this. One of the ways that I want to do it now, this isn't the only way to do chapter 17, but one of the ways that I want to, the, or the way that I want to go through it this morning is to, is to, is to reread Chapter 16, verse 33, and put this response. See, see the prayer of Jesus as a response to his disciples and, and their, their feeling of angst that they, that they have at this point. Um, this is chapter 16, verse 33. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And so Jesus, seeing their, their angst, seeing their, the, the, the feeling of this turmoil in them, he says, take heart, I have overcome the world. And then he begins to pray. Because it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, meaning everything proceeding, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and he said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all who you have given him. And he carries on and he carries on. And so the, the way I'd like to go through this is to say, well, if he has overcome the world and he is interceding for us, how do we overcome with him? How do we overcome with him? We overcome, I think in the context of chapter 17, we overcome with him when we share in his, in his life, which is what we see in verses 1 to 5. Christ in his life accomplished the work that he had been given to do. That's what he says. I've accomplished, in verse 4, I, I 
glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. He glorified his heavenly father while he was on earth because he accomplished the work that he had given him to do. Jesus is our example in this way. He glorifies the father by his obedience. And that's the same. The same is true for us, that we would glorify the father by our obedience. What we also notice is we overcome when we share in his life because his life is eternal. He has been given authority over all flesh. And as a result, that's the way the verse reads, as a result of having authority over all flesh, he has the authority to give eternal life. Which is amazing. He has the authority to give eternal life because his life is eternal. We overcome, secondly, we overcome when we know his name. And so he talks about what the disciples know. They know, they believe, they understand. He uses words like that in this section, verses 6 to 12. They know where I came from. They know that I obeyed your commands. They believed in my name. They believed in your name. Speaking of his father. And this idea of knowing or believing is a big theme in the prayer of Jesus. We overcome when we know his name. Name is equal in scripture to nature. Because the book of James tells us that, he says, he says you believe that the Lord your God is one? Well, that's great. Even the demons believe that and they shudder. And so it's not just to know about God, but it is to know what he is like, to know who he is, to have a personal relationship with him, which is one of the questions that I asked this last week. What's the difference between knowing about God and knowing God and having a personal relationship with him? Is there a difference? There must be. And so to know him is to know, to know his name is to know his nature, to know what he is like. There's also these incredible expressions of oneness. Oneness of believers is a non-negotiable of discipleship. The New Testament knows nothing of isolated believers. Rather, they're always found in fellowship with one another. You know, I was going to look for somebody, for somewhere nicer, a, di a nicer background, um, a nicer spot to do this video. But then I thought, you know what, it actually sort of fits the context. Because this room is set up with uh, a whole whack of chairs and tables. I think there's a couple, maybe 20, 23 tables in here. And eight chairs around every table is like 160 some, 70 some seats in this room for people to come together in oneness because they are believers, because they're indwelled by the same Holy Spirit. And so this room is actually, as cluttered and nasty as it looks behind me, is actually a great example of what we hope for, what we promote, what we desire as um, followers of Jesus. Because after the service, you're going to have soup and a bun together. And you're going to do that because of the oneness, the fellowship. You're going to pursue that. And you're going to, you, you look forward to it because the soup is good, but also because the company is good because these tables are going to be full of believers fellowshipping together. He makes, Jesus makes this interesting statement as he's talking about the keeping power of Christ, as he's talking about the keeping power of the Father, this, this idea of he doesn't lose any, this idea of everything, everyone in the, every follower that the, that the father has given to Jesus, he hasn't lost any of them. And he says, except for the son of destruction, which is Judas, uh, who would betray him. And, and so he says, so we can, we can get a little confused when we read that. And we can say, yeah, but wasn't Jesus, uh, or wasn't Judas, uh, you know, uh, uh, a Christian? Wasn't he, wasn't he a, a disciple? Wasn't he a follower of Jesus? Here's what we need to know. Judas was not an example of a believer who lost his salvation. Judas is not an example of a believer who lost his salvation. But he is an example of an unbeliever who pretended to have salvation. Multiple times we get commentary on Judas about, you know, um, about he, that he would betray him. Or that we get this, these comments in chapter 12 about his motive. We, we have all of these things that sort of paint this picture of like, Judas was never actually one of Christ's followers. He associated with Christ's followers. And we get this idea in, jo in Jesus' prayer that he was there in order to fulfill um, what the book of Psalms writes, that, there's, that his friend would betray him. And his friend would turn him over. And, and so he's, he serves a purpose, but his purpose is destruction. He's never been one of, he's never truly been in Christ. He's never believed into Christ. And so 
he's, he's not a picture of an, a believer who lost his salvation, but he is an example of an unbeliever who pretended to have salvation. Chapter 17, which is in front of us, um, it, it, as well as John chapter 10, clearly communicate the keeping and preserving power of the Father and the Son. And, and in the book of Ephesians, in chapter 1, Paul clearly communicates the keeping power of the Holy Spirit. So the Trinity together, um, in unity, is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are, are, are the, the source of the perseverance of the Christian. Um, and there is no losing of the Christian. Um, there is no slipping away. There is like, it's a, it's a, once you're saved, you're always saved. And, and if you can reject it, you never knew it. Um, and, and if you can fully reject it, you never knew it, is, is how John writes it out for us, is how Jesus prays. It's how, um, it's the represent, representation of scripture. And so, fourthly, or th sorry, third, the third way that we overcome with him is we overcome because we have his word. This is in 13 to 19. We overcome because we have his word. He says, now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. See that? I speak his word. I speak in the world that they may have joy fulfilled in themselves. We have joy because of his word. I have given them your word, and the word world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that, the, that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. Again, a comment about we overcome, we're set apart by his word. Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake I consecrate myself, that they may also be sanctified in the truth. His word gives us joy. His word assures us of his love. His word keeps us and sets us apart. There's this shift in the last piece of the passage. The, the shift, there's a shift from security, meaning the keeping power of God, the security, to sanctity. The holy living of those who God has set apart for the world, or from the world. There's this idea of oneness and holy living being a witness. Because by his word, we are witnesses to his work. The fourth way that we overcome is when we share in his glory. Now there's a shift from sanctity to unity. And again, we're back to this piece about oneness. Oneness is um, a witness, a gospel witness. That's what verse 21 says. It says this, verse 21. That they may all be one. So he says, verse 20, might as well start there. I do not ask for those only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. That they may all be one. Just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, they may also be in us. So that the world may believe that you have sent me. And so there's this oneness that comes out of, or is the source is, the model is, the oneness of of the Father and the Son. And that oneness is a witness to a watching world so that they would believe that Jesus is the one that the Father sent. That puts a lot of weight on our actions, <laughs> puts a lot of weight on our oneness, on our unity, on our love for one another. Our oneness is our witness in so many instances to a watching world. And the hope that we have, the hope that we share in our oneness, the hope that we share is this. Verse 24. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. In our oneness, we have this hope that we are going to see Jesus in all of his glory. In context, to keep this prayer of Jesus in context, context, it's interesting to see just how the disciples have expressed hardship and they've expressed uh, wondering, they've expressed questions and, and fear too. 
And Jesus' response is to pray for them. He says, I know you'll have tribulation, you'll have trouble, you'll have hardship. And his response is to pray. And I think that can be our response too. And you'll see as you read through what will be the next week of study and group time that we're really going to focus on, on that, on hearing what, what are the struggles and the tribulations and the hardships and then responding to or with or for one another in prayer. So I hope that this has been an encouragement to you. Again, just scratching the surface on John chapter 17. There's a ton more there. We could dive in way deeper. Um, but again, really want to hold out those non-negotiables of discipleship. We overcome when we share in Christ's life, when we know his name and his nature. We overcome when we have his word. And we overcome when we share in his glory. Let me pray for you. And then you can go to your groups. Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for Christ, that he intercedes for us. Thank you. Just, uh, I, I do pray that we would see the prayers that he prayed for us, answered in our own lives and in the lives of others. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. God bless.